Welcome back to Owanapedia, your one-stop center for the history of this country. Tony Geoffrey Owana and Herbert Semiano is in charge of operations where you can't see him. But he's there and he's saying, please, don't forget to subscribe to Owanapedia. So this is the, the animal you have before you, Marimu. You may come and talk to us and uh, give us your own, uh, whatever you want to tell us. Most welcome. Even without nuclear weapons, the South should be interested in the East-West talks about peace, but trying to avoid war. Why? Two wars took place, led by Europeans, Northerners, called World Wars, rightly. World Wars. War started 1914 and ended 1918. Many of you were not born. I wasn't. I was not born. It was, it was a world war because it spread all over the world. But it was started by Europeans for European reasons. We were affected. But we got involved in those wars. <coughs> 1939. 19 to 1945, another war broke out between, again, Europeans. <laughs> That's when uh, the Msevunis were born. I think Msevunis' father must have been a soldier. <laughs> <laughs> huh? He was recruited, but then he bribed his way out. <laughs> he, was, he, was, he was recruited in the 7th Battalion of the King's African Rifles. <laughs> Uh, the, the 7th Battalion, this fellow is, is a Museveni of the 7th Battalion of, uh, of, of the King's African Rifles. <laughs> you see how the wars, the European wars affect, they give us even names, the Museveni. <laughs> President Museveni has just invited Mwari Nyerere to speak. And he really comes in two hearts, like he himself says. One, he's, as you know, former president of Tanzania and chairman of the ruling party, Chama Chama Pindus, a recipe which he will bring later. Then two, he's in his capacity as the chairman of the newly formed South Commission, an organization that was formed to address the plight of gross indebtedness of countries in the Southern Hemisphere to the countries in the Northern Hemisphere, which are the rich ones. He was addressing the question of the net flow of resources out of impoverished South, again, to the Northern Hemisphere. That's why they formed an organization called the South Commission, of which Nyerere became chairman. Now, in this first part, he addresses that subject, something you must pay a lot of attention to, because it is as relevant now as it was at that time. Stay tuned, Oanapedia is in charge. We have all sorts of, of, of shades of opinions here. But we are trying to say one line must be leading. The nationalist line, that's the minimum position we accept. If you are not a nationalist, we don't accept you. Or, or eventually we shall fight you. But uh, if, you are, if you are a socialist, there are some socialists here. There are some capitalists here. There are also some feudalists. We, they are all there. <laughs> so the only thing you want is that you should be nationalist. You, whatever your ideology is, you must support Uganda, Uganda's independence. And you must support Uganda's unity. And you must support Africa's unity. And you must support you got your Africa's independence. That's all. So this is the, the animal you have before you, Marimu. You may come and talk to us and uh, give us your own, uh, whatever you want to tell us. Most welcome. First of all, I would like to thank you very much, Comrade President, once again, for this opportunity you've given me to, to visit Uganda, this time 
and also to take your time to take me round to several parts of Uganda to see the problems of your country and what is being done in trying to cope with those problems. I thank you also for this opportunity this morning not only to talk to your comrades in arms in your struggle to rebuild your country, but also in the explanation of what is going on. I'd like to thank you very much for all that. I am visiting your country wearing two hats. The first hat, although it's not uh, my, my, my permanent hat, well, I have no permanent hat. The first hat I wear is the hat, my hat, as chairman of the South Commission, something some of you may have heard and others may not have heard of the South Commission. And also, I'm coming here wearing my other hat, which is my hat as chairman of Chama Chama Pinduzi. But first I'd like to talk to you about the South Commission. In 1986, at the summit of the Non-Aligned Movement in Harare, it was announced there that a South Commission had been established and that I had been asked to be chairman of that commission. Or rather, there was an intention to establish a South Commission. And I'd been asked to be chairman of that commission and to establish it. And I was told that uh, that idea was well received by the heads of state and heads of government of the non-aligned movement. Naturally, I was, I was very pleased. But I thought that uh, I should spend some time in visiting a number of southern countries to find out whether, in fact, there are a sufficient number of countries in the South who accept the idea of a South Commission, and if so, what do they want? What do they expect this Commission to do? And I did make those travels last year. I started with Latin America, where I went to Venezuela and Peru and Uruguay, Argentina, Brazil, and Cuba. I returned to Dar es Salaam, and the following month, I went to Asia. I visited Malaysia and India, the Philippines, Indonesia and China. I went to North Africa where I visited Egypt, Algeria, and I went to Europe, to Yugoslavia. I went to Southern Africa where I visited Zambia and Zimbabwe. Altogether, I visited some 19 countries last year. As I say, to try and find out whether there is sufficient support in the South for the idea 
of the South Commission so that I could go ahead and, and form this commission. Secondly, what southern countries expected out of this commission, what do they want it to do. And of course, I was also talking to individuals just in case there is sufficient support for the commission to find individuals whom I would then invite to join the commission. And that commission eventually was announced. In July last year, I was able to announce the formation of that commission, a large commission of 28 members. We held our first meeting in October last year in a place outside Geneva in Europe. Uh, it's a South Commission, but it's, we were forced, for some reasons I don't have to go into, to establish our temporary secretariat in, uh, in Geneva. And we held our first meeting outside Geneva, where we discussed basically our terms of reference, our objectives, what do we want to do? How do we ourselves see our work and what do we want to do? So we discussed our terms of reference and our objectives. That was October last year. But while we were meeting, at that time, Africa, the Organization of African Unity had announced that they would be holding a special meeting in November, December to discuss Africa's problem of debt. And also some eight Latin American countries had announced that they would be meeting in November to discuss debt. So we discussed debt in the commission and agreed that perhaps we were not in a good position to be of very much help to the southern countries by making a statement on debt. We were not ready to make a statement on debt, and we agreed that we should give a little more time to study the problem and issue a carefully thought out uh, uh, statement on debt, which we did. We had our first, second meeting in March this year in Kuala Lumpur, in Malaysia, where we finally approved our terms of reference and also issued a statement on debt. We are going to be holding our second meeting in uh, our third meeting next month in um, Mexico. It's talked about in terms of divisions. There is an ideological division which began, people began to talk about mainly after the Second World War, called East-West. The East is a group of countries led by the Soviet Union. And it is basically socialist. The West is a group of countries led by the United States of America. And it's basically capitalist. And when they talk about their problems, usually they talk about problems of peace. That's usually what concerns them, avoiding war between the two groups. They're very powerful. And geographically, both are in the north. One is the northeast, and the other is the northwest. The northwest, capitalist, the northeast, socialist. But in the north, and developed. I say they, they, have, they face a confrontation, which they're discussing now, but it, the confrontation they, they discuss about is a confrontation of war and peace. 
And so now there is a big discussion of reducing armament, and they've begun the process of reducing nuclear arms. We wish them well. Uh, usually, we wish them well. We must wish them well. Usually, the South is not very much interested in this, in this discussion between East and West. So the South is not very much interested. And we have no right not to be interested. We must be interested. Even without nuclear weapons, the South should be interested in the East-West talks about peace, by trying to avoid war. Why? Two wars took place, led by Europeans, Northerners, called World Wars, rightly, World Wars. War started 1914 and ended 1918. Many of you were not born. I wasn't. I was not born. 1914, 1918. Called a world war. It was, it was a world war because it spread all over the world. But it was started by Europeans for European reasons. We were affected. We were very much affected in this part of the world. Tanz Tanganyika then, when the war started, was a colony of the Germans called Dorsch East Africa, including, uh, which included Rwanda and Burundi, and Southwest Africa, hmm? which we hope soon to call Namibia. Uganda here was under the British and Kenya was under the British. I think we got involved in, that, in those wars. So we in Tanganyika were involved in the wars, and you, Uganda here were involved in the wars, and Kenya was involved in the wars. Apana vita vietu, vita vya watu wengine, but we got involved in those wars. <coughs> that was 1914-1918. 1939, 19 to 1945, another war broke out between, again, Europeans. That's when uh, the Msevunis were born. I think Msevunis' father must have been a soldier. <laughs> <laughs> huh? He was recruited, but then he bribed his wealth. <laughs> he, was, he, was, he was recruited in the 7th Battalion of the King's African Rifles. <laughs> and the 7th Battalion, this fellow is a, is a Msevuni of the 7th Battalion of, uh, of, of the King's African Rifles. <laughs> You see how the wars, the European wars affect, they give us even names, the Museveni. <laughs> <laughs> That's how those wars affect us. So, this was with another war. Some mad European called Hitler, mad German, called Hitler. Of the same type as I mean. <laughs> the same type, except that, you know, this was an, a very a much more dangerous Amin because, because, and I mean, in a highly developed country, you know, wields lots of weapons, lots of power, and is much more dangerous. And he, I mean, here did, I mean, here went out, uh, went after the Asians, eh? I don't see, I don't think he killed very many Asians. But uh, Hitler went after the Jews and killed uh, Six million of them. Deal. And he believed uh, the Europeans were, were, what did he call Aryans? He called them Aryans, superior, superior race. And it had a right to govern the, the minor races. Nahasa wa Afrika wa niyo kabisa kabisa, you know, these fellows. He, I read the story about, he, he was writing about Africa and about Africans. I think some Olympic, uh, Olympic Games had taken place in Germany somewhere. 1936. 1936. And some black man from... Jesse Owens. Jesse Owens from the United States had won 
against Germans. And of course, this was terrible. And of course, the newspapers did write, you see, but Jesse Owens had won, you know, and you see, humans are equal, and so, and Hitler was annoyed. Equals? What do you mean equals? And he, he, he blamed the Jewish newspapers for this misrepresentation. <laughs> Here's this black man, he said, who wins, and the Jewish newspapers, instead of reporting the truth, they dis misrepresent this. They should be saying how wonderful the Aryans are, that they can train half apes to perform the acts of human beings. <laughs> <laughs> And instead of saying that they say these uh, subhumans are also, are also equal to humans. That was Hitler. He went too far. Had he simply stopped there, I don't believe we would have had a second world war, but he went too far and began attacking others whom the others didn't believe they uh, could be treated like that. So that was broke out and we were, again we were, it became a world war. We were involved. Today, if a war takes place in Europe, first of all, the Europeans will wipe out one another. How about it? would be very difficult for, for Europeans to remain and if a, a nuclear war broke out. It would not last long. It would last for a very short time. And so Europeans are very concerned. Northerners are very concerned. Some foolish people in some other countries think, you know, you can fight a nuclear war and you can survive it. It is, I'm told what your president says, it is they are ignorant. Perhaps they are not foolish. I should not use a strong word like foolish. They are ignorant. Uh, it is believed that it's very difficult to survive a nuclear war, win it and survive it. But now scientists say we would all be affected, everywhere in the world would be affected by a major nuclear war. And that's why therefore the South should be interested in the problems of peace, which I say at present are north, are, are northern problems discussed between the northeast and the, and, and the northwest. That's one, one divide, one divide in the world, east, west, basically ideological. There is another divide in the world, the other divide in the world. The other divide in the world is a north-south divide. The north basically has the industrialized countries of the world, the rich countries of the world, the developed countries of the world, are basically in the north. The Soviet bloc, the EEC, North America, Canada. It's, this is north. The north is the developed, the industrialized part of the world. You have some, some southern countries also developed. Um, New Zealand is in the south. Uh, Australia is in the south. Japan is in the south. Uh, so these are the really the exceptions. Countries geogra geographically in the south, but economically in the north, actually. So we include them in the, in the north. We call them northerners. The, the, when we, the expression we use, the northern countries, we include Japan, New Zealand, Australia, because they belong to that northern club of highly developed industrialized countries. The south, the south, the, the rural countries, the rural countries of the world, Wauzaji wa kahawa na pamba na tumbaku na banana. 
Those are in the South. Uganda, Tanzania, Brazil, India, Mexico. Mexico is uh, geographically in the North, but economically in the South. So that's why we use this pressy word, South, North. So when we talk about the South, we mean the producers of the raw materials, the non, the rural part, the rural part of the world. That's the South. This divide of North and South is a different kind of divide. It is the North, the East-West is a division between very powerful blocks. The northern, the northern block is very powerful, the whole of it. And each one of it, the Eastern block is powerful, the Northern block, the Western block is powerful. The South-North divide is really between a powerful North and a powerless South. South Haina power, in Amatoki in the south. But power, no. But the north controls what is going on. Uh, the decisions, the major decisions of the world, determining the price of coffee, the price of cotton, the price of tobacco, the goods we sell, is determined in the north, not in the south. So every morning from Monday, no, from Tuesday, every morning from Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I listen to a northern radio, the BBC, telling us what is happening to the price of cotton, of coffee, of tobacco, of tea because they, they matter for us in Tanzania. So I have formed a habit of listening to the prices. If you people don't listen, if your radios, you have radios which are working, you can begin a listening to. <laughs> which if, if your radios are working, because your radios come from the north. <laughs> you don't have your own radios. And your batteries come from the north. So the prices of the goods we sell are fixed in the north. The decisions determining those prices are made in the north. But we have to import things from the north. We must. This is a modern world. And sometimes we are very modern. Nasis to Najeribu are very modern. So we have things like this here. This comes from the north. It's Philips. It's a northern instrument, this one. And this one is also a northern one. I don't know where it comes from. It may be the same Phillips. It's A A K J. I don't know what it is. But I, it is northern. It can't be anything else. <laughs> uh, we we travelled yesterday. The day before yesterday, we went to to Jinja. Uh, we were travelling. We were travelling in a Mercedes. Huh? Northern. Uh, on the way, we, on the way, we, we, the, the road is very bad. That road is very bad to Jinja. It's now they are repairing it. Hmm? It is being repaired by two firms. Two firms. Molem from the north. And on the way, we saw another, another one. Sterling Astaldi from the north. A small road like this. So the price of what we sell is determined in the north, and the price of what we buy is determined in the north. And we sell cheap always, and we buy dear always. <laughs> so it is not surprising. I was listening. I must congratulate you, Mr. President. I, was li I, I listened to television yesterday when you were talking to your colleagues about uh, the imbalances the imbalances. And I do congratulate you. 
Because it is, we must know what is going on. We have to know what is going on. And if you have a head of state taking a piece of chalk and a blackboard, I think, was it black or yellow? <laughs> <laughs> a head of state taking a piece of chalk, explaining to it, his leaders eh, the problems of the simple economics of the modern life, that country has a future. I wonder whether when Museveni was selecting his slogan for the last campaign, securing your future, he was thinking about what Museveni had said over 30 years ago, securing your future. Because he says, when you have a president who does that, your country has a future. You subscribe to Owenopedia, you are one-stop center for the history of this country and you will not be disappointed. We are coming.